Hello everyone, this is the first optional live sync meeting of the Team Topologies book club. And we're going to go over the first part of the book, which, which had three chapters and we read them over the course of the last three weeks. Um, at least at some point within those three weeks, they were read. And so, yeah, um, thanks everybody for joining. Um, I structured the meeting agenda pretty lightly. I'm mostly interested in hearing your thoughts. I went through it and kept notes along the way, but I think the, the most important thing for me is kind of to hear from you what you learned, what you liked, what you didn't like, didn't like. Um, and then I think for me, I read books because I'm fairly pragmatic. I'd like to understand what I can poach and use in my day to day. Mm -hmm. And I think that's maybe the most sort of directly applicable. So yeah. Um, what did you learn, Gabe? You're typing away already. Yeah, uh, I think one of the things that was really interesting, uh, definitely touches on Conway's law a whole lot, which I thought was always true. But when I like sort of look at how we've designed some of the things in our product and our from a systems and architecture standpoint, it like you can see lots of very clear examples where like we've we've like designed a solution. Uh, siloed within like a specific you know uh product surface area um like a good example would be how we do eventing um like we have an events api endpoint and there are some shared objects in there for other things and then there's also some objects that are completely missing that should be there and then we have this other events endpoints for like resource state events for specific like objects that don't tie into the events thing because it, apparently we only keep the events table for three years uh, and so just like how that leads to what at the time feels like um, very quick wins, like good flow, but in the long run, like if you, it, it, we're not like really paying attention to how that's actually producing a confusing product experience, um, which I thought was pretty interesting. Yeah, I, I mean, I agree with that. I, I think I've recently learned in the memory team that I think we have I think five or six different metrics endpoints that all work in different ways and were implemented by different teams. And I think that's also an indication like people sort of locally solve their, their problem. Uh, but I think that's maybe an indication that, you know, we've, we've solved this because we were organized in that way and we never really, yeah, the solution sort of came out of that. So I think there's quite a few examples and Actually, I think one thing that I would like to do as a follow-up is collect them. I right? sort of like evidence that this is actually happening because I think that would be quite fun um, because then you can actually start thinking it was like, how should this look like, right? And um, yeah, I definitely agree. Um, yeah, I, I would like to hear more examples too because you know I'm newer and I'm kind of only familiar with my little area. So I... Yeah, we should collect examples. I would I would like that. I like with the, with the event stuff in particular, because I think the this was a bit back before my time or Christian's time, or I think even yours, when Epics was built and issues were built, right? Like mm -hmm. Epics was a separate, created as a separate object. And because it was, it it didn't fit in. It basically, they, they did the minimum possible. And so there's no events for it. But then like when more modern teams have come along, like, this is the eventing stuff. Now we're building out a separate endpoint for compliance and audit events, which is mm. sort of the same thing as capturing an event <laughs> in our events API. Uh, and so like it's, you still see teams doing it across the board. So I think the examples would be awesome. And um, Hannah, you have the next one. I thought it was interesting. I've certainly, use the term and heard the term like cognitive load or cognitive overhead a lot, but this was sort of the first time I'd seen like it split out into these three different types and then kind of with examples uh, related to software development. So I felt like it was pretty relatable and understandable how someone can have all three of these types at the same time, yet only one is really like the high impact in terms of delivering results, which was the, I'm looking at, if I keep looking down, like I'm looking at my book, it was the germane cognitive load, I think is the one that was actually pertaining to like the deliverable. Yeah, I actually, I've, I feel 
like when I read it, um, this is probably one of the things that resonated almost the most with me because I work in an, I mean, it's probably the same everywhere, right? It's not like enablement is special, but I know that quite a few teams in enablement have very, very high cognitive load because in order to, you know, do some of their work, they need to understand sort of almost every part of GitLab, right? Mm -hmm. And like, if you're in the database team, you kind of like sometimes you're sort of expected to know about all of those different areas. And it's very difficult to do certain things because you're going to break something. And it's all sometimes very difficult for people to even keep that complexity in their head. And I think we, we've, I think approached a, oh, thank you. I'm getting cheese delivered. Um, um, I think we are, we are also approaching a point with our product, right? With GitLab itself that, also, as a user, the cognitive load, cognitive load is super high, and so it's it's kind of everywhere. And I think we, um, I think there's a huge opportunity for us to like start actually maybe measuring and evaluating. It's like how do teams really feel about this, right? It's like do they feel they they can actually sort of hold the bits that they're responsible for in their in their own heads, right, and know how to do it, and maybe plan is a good example for. I remember a few sessions where Gabe, you sort of gave me the the overview of how all of those things are related to each other and why they are the way they are and why certain things are hard the way they are. It's just like, it's really challenging. I liked it. Yeah, yeah, me too. Agreed on that. Um, and I just took over the navigation category, so that's something that's really top of mind for me as well. Is like, how do we if, if a team can set up their typology in any way or they can structure their app in any way, how do we make GitLab function so that it can work for them too and deliver the, what, they, what they, their end goals are and have the nav support that or have them be able to customize something? Um, I'm kind of looking at, at it through that lens now, which is a really difficult problem to solve, but I think cognitive load or like hiding things that aren't needed, like big concepts like that, makes sense to support the way software teams work. I have the next oh, one too. So okay. uh, unclear or unintentional communication strategies, just something I was thinking about having a clearer definition for Slack channels or why I might use one versus another with a team. And I haven't really aligned on that yet other than my group channel with navigation, it feels like it could touch a lot of different, like, like basically every other product team. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I'm, I'm going to like sub bullet my point here because I, I really like the idea of having a team API and sort of on some level. Mm -hmm. And I recognize mm -hmm. that, you know, I've worked the longest with the geo team. And by now, for example, on the team page, we have like, specific instructions on like how to communicate with us. You know, if you want X, what do you need to do? You know, like, and, and I think that has helped and people have picked up on it. And there, there's often sort of additions, like we had an engineer recently proposed like, hey, you know, how do we handle these long running Slack threads? You know, what can we do? And I, it has helped a lot. You know, we have, I don't know if you have this work, but we have like a geo customer, um, project that we only use for issue tracking, for example. So if professional services or support or TAMs need cool. something from the GEO team that is sort of a problem statement, something that needs to be scheduled, they get directed there and they can create an issue and it has mm -hmm. templates for describing what they what's going on. I think those types of, this is how you actually interact with teams. I, I really love that because it otherwise it's, usually ending up in like slack people pinging and pinging and pinging and that's yeah quite disruptive at times yeah i like that idea how much traction do you get in there just fyi like how many issues per yeah, like 60 70 or so okay. um and they've evolved a little bit it's like it's mostly like I have, like I started and I had sort of an issue per customer. 
but now people just use it more as a, hey, you know, I, I have this thing with that customer or that thing, which is easier, sort of more like a support case basis. Um, but there's also still a lot of like ad hoc Slack stuff happening. Yeah. Do you, like do that. you, how do you deal with that input? Like, is it part of your planning process or how do you look at it? Well, I think um, in general, uh, I get pinged on it and then I decide sort of the course of action. It's mostly not implement feature X, right? Because that should go into um, you know, the regular issue tracker. It's mostly, hey, I have this customer, they really would like to talk about this, or we have this really complicated thing, you know, where we need some support from people. So it's more as a support support tool. Okay. Yeah. I feel like we get those questions in Slack and yeah, it would be good to put them somewhere where the, more than 90 days later, we can refer back yes. to them. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's exactly the intent. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. So you have the, you have the next one. Yeah. This is another interesting part. Um, it's like, I think more than probably most companies that I've interacted with, we've done a really decent job of creating autonomous teams most of the time. Um, up until recently with some allocation stuff. But I think we still operate within a monolithic structure, which goes back to like our value proposition of a single application, right? Um, but I also hypothesize that this leads to sort of like incessant context switching and more communication required than maybe necessary because you do have dependencies that are shared by a bunch of your teams and things aren't sort of designed and uh, siloed into their own little services that kind of all have contracts with one another. Um, and so like when I think about things like how can we go faster and increase the flow, like, and I look at some of our MR review things that we go through where there's like five different reviewers required and it takes like a week or two, right? Like, um, I, that's the first time I've ever experienced that in my life building products is like that level of like communication required to merge something. Cause usually it's just an engineer pair. They like write the MR together and they test it together and then they like just merge it cause it's done and they, <laughs> they both worked on it. Right. Um, which I think is sort of interesting. And I think the other key point was when organization design is at odds with architecture design or decisions, the organization design yes. always wins, right? Yes. Which kind of goes back to help explain sort of uh, why requirements became their own thing and epics became their own thing and issues became their own thing and merge requests are their own thing, even though they all share about 50% of the functionality uh, because the, that's how we were organized, organized as a company. Um, is cross-functional teams, which I thought was really interesting. Yeah, I, I really, I mean, this is, for me, you know, I, I'm kind of, I've started this, I mean, it's kind of, it's interesting, um, like Kristen and Gabe, you're both in, in this like search as a service epic that I opened, and it's a gigantic can of worms, but it's very exciting, because I think based on some of the things that I've read here, and sort of the the learnings from from this, I'm kind of thinking it's like, okay, you know, we have teams often, and that, that's already good. But I think I'm trying to ask myself, it's like, is the team structure actually such? And have we defined, you know, how this should look like to actually get the software architecture that we need? And I think in some places, we've not done that. And we've not really been very explicit about this either. And sort of speaking about like monolithic or um, services is like to some to some extent it's like it doesn't really I mean I'm out on a limb here it's like if you have a monolith right then you still need to define boundaries but they happen to be sort of within that monolith but you can still define them because so like these are the things that we are exposing that we expect others to work with and I think that sort of making that much more explicit is is really one of the things that I would want to do and also figure out is like what is this team actually trying to do right it's like are they are they set up for for success or are they really swamped because they are entangled in this sort of hairball of of um you know like software that is a consequence of how we how we chose to organize ourselves I think there's a really big opportunity to make that to improve that so I thought that was super interesting yeah, I think the thing going back to like our um, our our kind of product hierarchy or organizational hierarchy is that like categories are supposed to be standalone products like in the market. And if you think about that, like teams are building standalone products, but 
they're not thinking about all of the shared use cases across our single our single product, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so like, that's sort of the thing where uh, I haven't finished all of the chapter three yet, but I'm interested in learning more about the different, the stream teams versus mm -hmm. the kind of the, the more complex driven teams. Cause it's almost like we need to think about how do we take some of these abstract things that are shared across all to have one team work on that and own it so that they increase flow that then increases the flow of all these other teams. Yes. That makes sense. Yeah, I think this is actually, uh, yeah, we're jumping a little bit ahead here, but I think this is also a sort of a, maybe we, when we finish reading this, we can sit down because for example, in enablement, I think we have mostly sort of platform like teams or um, complicated subsystem as a service type things. We have some very specific sort of value driven teams and that may be very different in other, in other sections, but I think it helps to be explicit, right? And then actually also maybe figure out it's like, well, maybe we need a team that is specifically only dealing with our eventing system, right? And then like, maybe that's a poor idea, but it's like, if we figure out that this is a complex thing that we need to solve and then other people can build all sorts of things on top of it, right? You probably want one team to own all, only that and they may not necessarily need to produce a customer facing experience, their job is just to make sure that that thing works really well so that we can build amazing things or search or whatever it is. I think that's an opportunity that comes out of realizing that we, yeah, the org chart limits us maybe sometimes. Does the working group kind of fit that mold too a little bit? The concept could be those cross-functional initiatives as well in the structure, like we do kind of have that mechanism where we could go after a specific goal or an architecture move or something and rally everybody cross stage. But yeah, I, mean, I don't know that I think about that as frequently as I could or how that would apply to some of the goals. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe uh, like I, I'm some, like I, I've been part of some work groups that I thought were very short lived and nice that sort of helped outcome right and then i'm also part of some work groups that are very long running and um i think they definitely have this opportunity for example for search to say like hey what do we want to accomplish here and then yeah. maybe make a recommendation saying like this is how we should actually structure that to accomplish those goals and that's the output of the mm -hmm. um, of the working group yeah i've been at four or five working groups now at GitLab and then and every single one it takes years to make progress because they are sweeping changes that go across many groups and stages and departments or whatever and they actually get alignment between all of them requires everyone to buy in and like it's almost like um like with the groups and project stuff and workspaces like I, that was in a working group for 16 months and then the only thing we got out of that is we convinced leadership that they needed to dedicate a team solving the problem which now they're like eight months into solving the problem. So it's been a total of two, two plus years with like very, very little like to show for it. Um, so it's, I don't know, but I've also found a lot of times it's because the people who join the working group, like <clears throat> still have all their normal day-to-day -day responsibilities. And it's almost like additive work that you can't make progress on. If you do have to cut something out, it's usually that. So you can get your other stuff done, which I think is sort of problematic too. All right, off to the, the things that you didn't like. Um, I couldn't remember if anywhere, they, so they refer constantly to engineering teams. I was like, does that include product or is this just talking about a team of developers? I was unclear exactly what their definition is. Yeah, that's a good point. I'm not sure. Maybe I missed it as, as well. I, I actually- see designers maybe, in there either. Because I almost always translate this into team that also have sort of has cross functions, right? Because I, I think that in many instances, otherwise you can't be successful, right? It's like you need software engineers, front end, back end designers, you know, and I, especially, especially for value teams, right? So. Right. Yeah, I bet you're right. I bet it does include like product and UX and stuff. It just but wasn't. I, yeah, it wasn't explicitly stated. 
Gabe has the has the page number oh. with the definition. Oh. Bam. Yeah. Oh. They just said because I highlighted this because I like I've been dealing with like why don't we have teams in GitLab is like an org like part of our knowledge architecture, right? And their definition is a stable group um, uh, of five to nine people who work toward a shared goal as a unit. Yeah. So yes. it doesn't talk yeah. about engineers or anything else. It's just that. And I think we you could argue that GitLab is generally pretty good in trying to have teams of that size. It may breaks down in some areas where I think the, at least my impression is the most sort of functional teams that I've seen follow exactly that pattern. And it gets really iffy when you go a lot bigger or a lot smaller, right? So, yeah. Yeah, the, the shared goal is important too. I'm, I'm gonna talk about that and what would I change, but I think that the, the group is aligned towards something, your direction, yes. achieving something. Yes. Yeah, the one thing that I didn't like, because I felt like this is, there was a section, I think in chapter two, where they were sort of brushing off like monoliths as, a, as an anti-pattern and we should not do that. And I'm not even saying that is untrue, but it felt to me like a, a technical implementation detail. I'm just like, we should, we should, and I think this is kind of the point, right? You can structure your teams and based on Conway's law, depending on how you do this, you will get a certain software architecture essentially. And, you know, there are upsides and downsides to one or the other thing. Um, and I think you can have a really good monolith if you have very clear boundaries within that, right? And not, you don't need microservices to be successful. So I was a little bit like, hmm. but, you know, that, that was maybe just a, a bit of a nitpick. Yeah, I thought that was interesting too. It also made me think of um, back in like early 2000s, I guess, is when Jeff Bezos, it's 2002, gave the mandate to Amazon to basically all teams expose their data and functionality through service interfaces. Uh, the only way to communicate with other teams is through these interfaces. Uh, and there's no way to direct link into a team's thing except for it's like through its public API. But, but basically everything else doesn't matter. So however else like the teams want to build them, as long as they can maintain those contracts with one another is fine. Yes. Which was, I, I thought was a really cool way to like sort of force the architecture to map to the organizational structure uh, in a very intentional way. And I think it's paid off huge for them. Yes. And I think this is like, I, I have at least two examples like the, the GEO team, for example, has a sort of self-service framework by now where other engineers can make their stuff GEO compatible. But it's not, you know, you could, it's, it's like more of a framework than an API, but it's a very clear contract, like what do you need to do, right? And how you need to interact. And um, then Gitterly has an API, how to interact with Git data, right? That is very clearly its own service. And I think these things, you know, can be very successful because like arguably even Gitterly, it is one team, right? It's like one small team, right? And there are of course issues with our Git data, but that's the, the thing that drives, you know, essentially our most important data. That's pretty cool, right? If you think about it, just in terms of like the impact, but it's, it's their thing. Thanks for keeping notes, by the way. All right, so how does it apply to your current work, um, Gabe? I'll be quick, but I, I think the cognitive load for project management is incredibly high, like between like issues and milestones and iterations, also to-dos notifications, like email delivery. And like, there's just so many things that that team is responsible for that like they're always contact switching and I've got I've heard from the engineers a lot that this is one of the things that's demotivating to them um so that like I paid special attention to that um and then I also pay have paid attention to how we've done when we split up teams or done temporary headcount resets it completely disrupts the flow momentum of everything we're working on like we just started to get traction with work items and then we lost half of our team and then it stalled out and we still haven't shipped it right um I think also really interested in 
thinking more about how to organize teams within plan or like at least the architecture because we're working towards work items which is like the shared thing across the, all the teams can use which is technically a dependency and according to the book like we shouldn't have dependencies across teams but how do you slice up that kind of architecture in a way that each team can own it and own part of it and be autonomous with it and i think we <clears throat> we're getting to a good place when and how to split that up but it's also sort of an interesting uh interesting thing to think about within the context of the first part of this book oh and then the last point i would have is this has actually come up because of the workspaces group uh and what they're working on and like the the knowledge ar architecture within the GitLab the product itself because we don't have the, the the concept of teams like we have groups and projects right um, but because of that and this book also touched on I think in the <clears throat> section where it talked about the three um, sorry one second the three different uh, organizational structures that like there's a formal structure which is the org chart and it facilitates compliance. So that's like our departments, the informal structure, which is the realm of influence between individuals. And then the value creation structure, how work actually gets done based on interpersonal and inter-team reputa reputation. Um, <clears throat> and right now we can only support one of those representations in GitLab, like in our knowledge architecture. So all of our customers actually have to pick which one they want to use it for. <laughs> and then they're like uh, screwed if they pick one that isn't most optimal for collaboration. Uh, but then they have to sacrifice compliance things because they can't really do that super well. Or if they do use, like there's all sorts of problems within our product itself because we can't gracefully support these three different structures represented in GitLab and they all work interoperable well with one another, if that makes sense. Yeah, thanks for sharing. Um, yeah, for me, cognitive load, cognitive load is really top of mind, if that's even possible with high cognitive load. Um, I've, I find that very tricky sometimes, just uh, to keep everything sort of in, in my head. Whereas like last year, there was a time where I was responsible as the PM for geo database memory and for sharding. And at that point, that was just completely overwhelming at times. And so um, I, I, I really enjoyed that. I think I'm really enjoying thinking about the structure of our teams and the architecture and like trying to figure out if all of these things actually match what we want to accomplish. <laughs> and I think that's, that's really something that I've started to do and I think I would like to formalize and outline. And then one thing that I also realized and that's maybe a bad sign thinking about it is that I think I've been long enough at GitLab that if you look at the org chart, right, and how that is structured, and then I look at how I actually sometimes get things done, I realize like I, I rely a lot on the informal, like sort of organizational structure of like spheres of influence, pulling people in, you know, like all of that, but it's really not reflected in how we are organized. And that's actually really risky because it it takes a long time to get to that point where, you know, you know, like, well, I, I know Gabe, right? So if I have a question, I can go to Gabe, right? And talk to him and maybe get some insight. But if you look at the org chart, right, we have nothing really in common with each other, right? And if that interaction becomes critical for actually getting something done, then that's really a problem because, you know, that, you know, shouldn't, be the case for people joining GitLab. They should be able to have impact without having to build all of that out. And so, mm -hmm. so that, that was, uh, I think, hugely relevant. All right, I think I have the next point. Um, Kind of one of the points the book made was that basically these teams should be highly specialized and have a small sort of unit of things that they're responsible for um, in order to lower cognitive load. And I feel like that's already kind of happened on my team, um, although it's not formally acknowledged anywhere. Like we have one developer, especially I worry if something happened to him. He's like the only specialist we have in a certain area or if he heaven forbid quit <laughs> or got sick or something like 
I feel like almost our engineers have split off into their little specialties. And it's like, if you have questions about this thing, I know who to ask, even though it's like not really documented anywhere, but I don't know if anybody else's teams have that or not, but. It definitely happens. And I, what, one of the things that I'm trying to, to do is in, in planning, um, I, I always try to assign more than one person to a work stream um, so that they kind of know what's what. But yeah, I mean, that's, that's definitely an issue. And I mean, we had like, we have situations where like for the decomposition work, we had to change the load balancing code for GitLab databases. It's a very specialized area of GitLab. And Yorick was probably the only person who even understood how that thing was working. Right? And so he was the only person who could actually do it and he did it and then he left. So it's, a, it's one of those things like, okay. And then it's, it's pretty risky. Yeah. Yeah, we, we have some of that on my team too with, with different things. I mean, there's like specialists who know more about like Markdown and GitLab flavor Markdown and stuff, but I think you have domain expertise, but when it comes to the code, like I, I think collective code ownership, I've experienced like when you really have that, you're actually way more uh, able to maintain flow because you don't get disrupted if one person gets sick or if one person quits or whatever. Um, so I think that's something that we should talk to our engineering stable counterparts about if we're like super concerned and see what we can do to encourage collective code because okay. it it's super healthy in the long run i think um, oh, i'll just double down on what gabe said that was one thing i really appreciated in plan was that they would just pick up all the engineers could pick up anything whereas in the the team i had before that the EMs were very particular in giving certain domain expertise to certain people. And it seemed to go faster because people were really good at that stuff, but it wasn't as, yeah, it didn't, it wasn't de-risked the way it is when everybody kind of can know and work on anything. Right. Um, I had a point here too. So like, as Gabe mentioned, there's tons of categories in plan. I'm noticing that too in foundations. We don't have as many, but the team is kind of overwhelmed. So getting the team clear with specific quarterly, quarterly themes and letting them know you don't have to use your brain on this category for this release or this quarter. We've got this theme together and we're going to go after these specific things that match our direction. This kind of helps the team feel less overwhelmed, I think. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, I've also done that with backup and restore and I've put it into the direction page because I, I was made the owner of it, which is very good because it needs to be owned, but we, have, we decided not to prioritize it. And, you know, we essentially have our standard response, which is like, thank you. Is it a, a P1 or, a, you know, like an S1 or S2? You know, if not, then, you know, we, we will reprioritize it at a given point in time. That has helped I also because that's that expectations. My, yeah. yeah. My direction page is where the team's aligning on that. So it's got a big zero goose egg next to the ones we're not touching. And then they're all bought in too. Yeah. I like that. Cool. All right. And the la then the last one is what change would you consider for your group GitLab after reading this first part? Um, so I've been thinking about this since December and I did have a big long customer call um, with someone who recommended this book to me and the way they were using this to think about their huge organization that's using GitLab. Um, so I have had this on my mind and I've been talking to my engineers in plan and then now on the foundations team. But one thing I noticed is that um, on the three different teams I've been on, people tended to identify with a different identity. So the first one, they were aligned to the group direction, the first team I was on at GitLab. The um, second one, they aligned to, they would say, I'm this stage and I'm a front end engineer. So they were aligning more to the stage and their role. And um, in the current team, they're aligned to the group and this bigger design goal of fixing SUS. So as I'm starting to talk to my team, it's something I've been rolling in is like, how do you think about this? Or what, what do you call yourself in the world? Do you, are you 
I'm the database person or what is your um, self identity? And that helps me see how much my direction is influencing the team. So my goal with this, a new one I just took on is to align around the direction first and it's been slower moving, but it's the team is starting to get to the point where they're asking really good questions about how we can actually achieve the, the direction. And I'm being really intentional with it at this sort of third try <laughs> that I have here with a new team I'm just picking up with. So some things we could do maybe at GitLab to try is like PMs could be more intentional with those questions. We could even do a survey with ICs, like how do you see yourself? What gets you up in the morning? What are, the, what are you driving to? Are, and we could start to see whether our directions are really hitting home um, with our individual groups and then maybe on a bigger level too. Those are just some of sort of the takeaways I've been using it locally on the teams I've been on. Cool. Thanks for sharing. And I mean, I think that's a that's a huge, <laughs> a huge undertaking as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So I think I think for me, one of the things that I want to do with maybe starting in enablement, but like to me, this is this is one of these books where I feel like, okay, you know, if all of these things are true, right, then I would like to understand how that impacts our own structure, the teams that I work with, and really start asking these questions. It's like, oh, you know, are they like what do these teams own? You know, do they really know what they own? You know, for the things that they own, can they make the changes that they need to make in a way that makes sense? And then also for a specific sort of areas, um, like I think it's like, are we actually setting this up in such a way that we we get the success that we that we want? I mean, the search bit is maybe sort of a starting point for that where it's like maybe there are sort of bits in our product where we need to recognize that we've not really set them up in such a way that we can actually build the things that we need for our customers and then i want to understand how should we set them up right to make that happen what are the changes that we really need to make and um sort of take those learnings um, i think yeah, and then also asking ourselves a little bit, it's like, where are we sort of adversely affected by, by Conway's law? Uh, because I do think, Gabe, you said that in the beginning, the org structure is going to win. And that is, I think that is just going to happen. And I, I, I feel that. And so the, you know, if that is also a thing that we can change. And maybe that's also really interesting input for GitLab and for GitLab's managers maybe, or the people that make team decisions because that stuck with me. It's like, if people who don't understand how software architecture, like, or why that is important for delivering for our customers make the decisions on the org structure, then you probably end up in a situation where you're at odds with each other. So I think for, for PMs, right, for product leaders, I think that's also a good reminder to read a lot about software architecture and figure out why, <laughs> why that matters, right? Yeah, <laughs> I was gonna say, maybe I need a refresher in that as I'm reading this book. <laughs> yeah. All right, Gabe. I'd be interested to do that with you. Uh, so basically I second this. Um, because like I've been doing the themes thing for a long time, but even if you just limit it to a few and you have the same themes for like six months, the cognitive load's too high, like at least in plan and things like key things move sus in the products the whole forward never get touched. Like a good, good example is to-dos and notifications. Like we so badly need a unified notification center in GitLab. So we can do Gmail. Like there needs to be a way to look at all the issues or merge requests that you're subscribed to in a single view like an activity feed type thing. Uh, and there's like so much customer feedback about it, but literally I can't introduce that cognitive load on top of the team in addition to what they already have and expect them to make any progress there. Um, so I'd be like, love to dig into that. And eventing is a good example too. Like I started down this rabbit hole because a customer complained about along the lines of like, I can't actually go to any API to get like the system notes that are in an issue or merge request or the activity feed, right? Of the things that happen because there is no single endpoint that you can actually get that data from. It's stitched together from a bunch of different places. Um, and so like our architecture is in like in directly impacting 
our customer's ability to use our product, even if it's just the API, right? Which I thought was really fascinating. Um, yeah, I, I agree with that. And I think actually, I sometimes feel that depending on what you're talking about, like let's say eventing, no single team is actually able to move this by themselves anymore because they're not really fully responsible for all of it or actually are in a position to do something about it. And that means that you can, even if you're like really like, I'm going to take this on, that the, you increase the cognitive load so much and you have so many interdependencies, <laughs> you're probably not going to get it done, right? And I think that's a, that is really, I think a challenge, right? And I think then maybe we need to kick something off and say like, well, actually in order to sort this out, you know, this is how we need to organize a few things differently right, to, to solve that, right? It will maybe impact more than one, than one team. Um, I don't know how to do that uh, yet, quite frankly. One thing that we did that is interesting, just to add on that search is also really interesting. We, you and I have talked about this a lot of times, but the first step we took within plan um, is this was Kristen and Melissa and I talking about how we should split stuff up is that like the product planning team is going to own the every like sort of search experience and the filter bar. Cause previously you would have like my team would own the issue list filter bar. Her team would have owned the epics list filter bar on the roadmap, but they were all different. So they were implemented three times in different ways and so we're like this is like crazy so we at least said one one team is going to own anywhere there's a filter bar in a plan view that team owns it no matter what period like right but now i think the next step beyond that is saying like how can we work across stages with like you know search yeah it comes and, like, to foundations it, and, yeah, and yeah we, and the search as a service and it's broader than just yeah. plan well, I think it's, yeah. it is one of those things where these these boundaries between teams, when they're well defined, right, they can lead to a situation where it's really clear that, let's say, foundations owns the filter bars, right, the three different types that we have, or let's say we have one type, right, but they they and they really focus on making that work well, but they don't need to know about how that gets indexed in Elasticsearch, you know, the data that they're getting out of that, because. You know, that's really not their responsibility and not their goal, right? Their goal is to offer a great filtering experience. And, you know, I think that's, there's a lot of interesting opportunity there. And so maybe as an outcome of this book, you know, maybe there is an opportunity for us to like figure out sort of a test balloon and say like, we take an area and try to set it up differently to see how that actually can work. I'm down for search and filters. Let's just hit it. Maybe that's the one. Everywhere. Yeah. Please do. That All one right. and event, eventing are the two that I would put my, my yeah. weight behind. Cool. Um, I had one other insight I added here. And this also comes back to that other conversation I had. But if there was a way that GitLab itself could render team org structure, like all of our users in some way where you could visually see it and then see our our architecture in contrast to that, whether it's a diagram with connection lines, the idea was that teams could rate the connection lines to other teams that might be blocking them. So if like I'm the example is like, no, not that this would happen, but I could rate the design system team as always blocking me. It's a two out of 10, that line between my pod and theirs. And then there's a better discussion that could happen or a different structuring or something. So giving visibility into topologies in GitLab plus a way to status report or report on, yeah, you know, like broken lines or serious issues and formalizing that. Um, and that would be super cool. I think it would look it very would. interesting. It's like, <laughs> yeah. As long as I'm not in the center of it, it's like all lines <laughs> leading, it's like everything's broken down and right? that would be. Yeah, <laughs> everything's red. Um, <laughs> But I mean, it might be a cool way to think about looking at our users. I know we don't really track to orgs. We have orgs in our OKR world where we actually report up through a chain, but I don't see that in GitLab anywhere. Like the fact that it would know my manager and the whole way up. So something to think about too. Uh, I was just gonna add to that. You should drop your thoughts or whatever into that issue that I linked. It's not even owned by my team. I think it's the workspaces team, but I, I like sort of have been participating and collaborating in the conversation because I want to be able to do that too. 
and our customers want to be able to do that too but like our our product can't support it um right now yeah and so i think the more that we can like have people like like you share your thoughts and perspective Mm -hmm. then it won't be just like me (laughs) yeah yes cool thank you cool all right we're almost at time um at, at the end of it a quick mini retro are you enjoying the book so far yeah yes cool. would you uh, would you say for the next meeting we'll we'll use the same structure uh, the live meeting um i thought we i thought it was quite nice to collect it in that way yeah i thought yeah, it was I great it. I, I think yeah, this is like, I got more value out of this 50 minutes than I did out of just like reading the three chapters by myself, so. <laughs> yeah, no, that's good. That's good feedback. Um, I I will continue to encourage people to sort of drop notes along the way, um, but I, maybe this is an indication that sort of every three weeks, you know, for three chapters gives us enough to talk about for 50 minutes and reflect on it. Mm-hmm. And I think that um, that feels good. So thanks everyone for for contributing. I really enjoyed it. Um, mm-hmm. I'm having fun with this one. Um, yeah, so thanks for setting this up. Me too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks, that, Fabian. I'm I'm really glad that we we do something like this anymore. I missed it a little bit. I don't know when we did the last book club. It was a long mm-hmm. time ago. So all right, then have a great rest of your days and talk soon. All right. Bye. Thanks. Bye.